when trying to save money on the wedding totally backfires. That's coming up next on the Wedding Planning Podcast. Hey there, it's Kara, and I believe that every engaged couple deserves the expertise of a down-to-earth, honest, and professional wedding planner. Join me each week on the Wedding Planning Podcast for straightforward advice designed to streamline and simplify your wedding plans. Are you ready to ditch the crushing wedding overwhelm and expense felt by so many engaged couples? To sign up for a free three-day trial of my revolutionary digital wedding planning package, visit weddingplanningpodcast.co slash vault. That's V-A-U-L-T. There's no promo code required for the free trial, and I can't wait to see you there. Enjoy the show. Why, hello there. Welcome to today's brand new show. It is so great to have you here. Today, we're going to be chatting all about when trying to save money on your wedding can completely backfire. We have a jam packed show, and I'm really excited to get into this topic with you. Aside of college educations, new homes, and new cars, your wedding likely has one of the biggest price tags that you've ever paid for anything in your entire life. You're spending tens of thousands of dollars, so of course you're trying to save some money. You're not out there researching the most expensive venue in your area. You're not looking for ways to spend more money on your invitations. When a potential photographer or caterer gives you a quote for their services, you probably don't say, well, that sounds okay, but do you have anything that costs more? If you've been listening for a while, I hope you know me well enough to know that I am not the wedding professional who's going to tell you never to try to cut this corner or don't dare hire a friend or a non-professional to do X, Y, or Z. I see this type of messaging a lot. For example, if you do your own wedding day hair and makeup, it's totally going to fail and you should really hire a professional to do it for you. Or if you skimp on a photographer, you will regret it for the rest of your life. If you have your cousin make your cake, it will probably be a complete disaster. You should really hire a professional for that. You should really hire a professional for that. If you take your dress to a neighborhood tailor instead of the big box bridal store where you bought it, it's going to end up in shreds and you'll have no dress to wear. You should never consider a non-wedding professional for that job. Now, the trouble with this is (laughs) that professional service providers in pretty much any industry you can imagine have an agenda, and that agenda is to sell their product or service. And whether you hear from a wedding professional on a podcast, you read their articles on a blog, or you see their posts on Instagram and Facebook, Their position is probably that hiring a professional is the best way to go. After all, they say, this is your wedding. You can't afford to cut corners on the best day of your life. Well, for lots of this, I call BS. Sure, if you have a wedding budget in the six figures, then hire a professional is a great option for everything I just listed and more. But most of us do not have $100,000 to spend on our wedding. So making swaps and saves here and there is a completely necessary part of planning so that we don't go thousands of dollars into debt, which is never a good idea. Here's a doozy for you. We hired our wedding photographer off Craigslist for $500. True story. And I'm not here to tell you that it was a horrible idea that backfired and you should never trust any wedding photographer who hasn't shot 500 weddings and cost less than $5,000. That is just not me. It's not my style. But... 
And this is a big but. I'm also not here to tell you that you should definitely hire a photographer off Craigslist and it'll work out perfectly and there's no risk involved and you'll live happily ever after and sleep soundly knowing that you saved a couple thousand dollars and beat the system. To be crystal clear, there's no right or wrong one size fits all solution for the myriad of wedding decisions that you have to make over the next few months. I will always encourage you to use your intuition and use our weekly time together to review all the options that you have available and select what feels best for you and your unique situation. This is a long intro to the show, longer than I usually do, because I really feel strongly about what we're talking about today and I really want to set things up right. The truth is that sometimes no matter how much research you do or how many great reviews someone has or how confident that you feel you're making the right decision, things can just go wrong. You'll probably have a wedding backfire or two or even three over the course of getting everything lined up in the next few months. That's just part of life and it's definitely a part of wedding planning. I wish I could wave a magical wand that would shield you against anything going wrong, but of course, that's not realistic. So the next best thing is let's explore some common areas of wedding planning where couples try to cut a corner, save some money, and they leave something out, and then sadly, it all backfires in terms of lost money, lost time, lost sanity, and sometimes all three. If you find yourselves at a cost-saving opportunity crossroads and you don't know which way to turn, I have some smart questions that you can ask yourselves and potential vendors that I hope will guide you towards making the best decisions for you and your wedding day. So when you find yourself wondering, hmm, should we cut that corner? And what are the potential outcomes or pitfalls that might come of it? Is trying to save $1,000 in this area going to totally backfire and end up costing us $2,000? Hopefully after today's show, you'll have some solid answers to some of the most common situations so that you can make the best decision for you. For one couple, that might mean hiring a photographer off Craigslist for 500 bucks. For another couple, that will never be an option that's on the table. And you know what? Both sides are totally fine. So with that, let's get started with where we left off last week. If you missed last week's episode about day of coordinators and wedding planners, I think you should absolutely go back and have a listen. There was a ton of really valuable information that can't be missed. So here we go. A couple is considering two venues, a blank space that includes nothing and requires a lot of work. That one is $7,000. On the other hand is an all-inclusive venue for $24,000 where literally everything is handled, minus a photographer, DJ, the dress, and cake. And I'll share with you some excerpts from her note. The first venue option is our favorite, but it's essentially just an empty space. We would have to figure out a coordinator, caterer, bartenders, the bar itself, setup, teardown, cleanup, etc., etc. The empty space venue has a fee of $7,000 and then we do all the rest. We were thinking of getting a taco truck and having a more casual party, but we both work full time and don't want to do a ton of work when it comes to planning the wedding. Plus, we have no idea what we're doing and we certainly don't want to have to lift a finger on the day of. Okay, so last week in our day of coordinator versus wedding planner episode, we ended the show with her first question, which is, should we hire a wedding planner, a day of coordinator, or maybe both? The million dollar question for today's show on cost cutting situations that can backfire is, 
if we go with the empty space venue, do you think we could actually save money or do you think it will end up being the same price or maybe even more and a lot more work? This whole situation that we just laid out is really common in wedding venue searches. Can you beat the system and save money with a blank do-it-yourself type space or are you better off going with the all-inclusive option and just paying one flat price to have everything taken care of? Here are a few general guidelines and then I'm going to lay out some hypotheticals to really illustrate the situation. So first off, you're going to want to ask yourself, are you willing to do all that extra work? Setting up an empty venue space, and the listener alludes to this in her note, doing all that research, the booking, and following up with all of those vendors on your own takes a ton of time, patience, follow-up, extra effort, and stress. If you have the budget to hire a full-service wedding planner, then that's all stuff that they can handle for you, but that's given that you can afford a full-service planner, and again, we covered that in detail in last week's show, so I'm not going to go into it a ton today. If you're up for the challenge and you think it would be fun to manage all the details on your own, I'm raising my hand, I think that sounds fun. Then if that's you, if you're on board for the extra work, the extra time, the extra energy, then let's start this comparison and see if it makes sense. Let's start by making a list of everything that you're going to need to have covered in that empty venue. Now, of course, not everything I'm going to list here applies to every wedding situation, so you'll need to tailor it to your specific space. And for a recap of everything that I'm about to rattle off, you can visit today's full blog post at weddingplanningpodcast.co slash wedding dash pitfall. That's weddingplanningpodcast.co slash wedding dash pitfall, P-I-T-F-A-L-L. All right, the list of things that you will potentially need to handle on your own, tables and chairs for your guests for the ceremony and the reception, tablecloths and napkins, decorations and flowers, food and drinks, staff to serve the food and drinks, staff to set up and clean up, both throughout the meal service and at the end of the night, a mobile bar, serving stations, dance floor, lighting, rented dishes, flatware, glassware, napkins, portable restrooms, parking attendants, or separate transportation arrangements like shuttles. Whoa, (laughs) right? Again, depending on your space and the specifics, not all of these will necessarily apply to every situation. You might not need to bring in portable restrooms. You may not need parking attendants. But do you see how quickly all of the rentals, the food and the drink, the additional staff how quickly all of those expenses would add up. If you're trying to decide between a blank space and an all-inclusive venue, first you need to get really clear on everything that you would need to be responsible for in the blank space venue. Much more detail, much more information and questions to ask yourselves in that blog post to guide you for today's show, weddingplanningpodcast.co slash money dash pitfall. Have a visit if this is something that applies to you. If you're on the fence about this, then make a list like we just did of everything that you'll be responsible for arranging and then get to work. Pick up the phone and start getting quotes on all the individual line items that you're going to need to bring in. Add everything up and don't forget the fee for the space itself. In this case, it's $7,000 and then see where you land. If it's close, that final number you're looking at, and you don't have the time or the desire to pull everything together on your own, then you probably want to consider the all-inclusive option. On the other hand, if it's a landslide and you're looking at saving potentially five to $10,000 and you're 100% on board for the extra time spent researching and managing everything, then sign me up. As long as you've been thorough in your research and you haven't left out anything major, then the blank space sounds like a wonderful option. 
So that is what you should do. On the flip side, and to wrap this all up, a money saving backfire would be to look at the two venues and look at the price difference between the two and blindly go all in with the $7,000 option instead of the $24,000 option because on the surface, it looks like you're saving $17,000. Without any further research, that is not a smart decision. And that empty space venue could easily turn into a complete nightmare of a money pit. I can think of endless scenarios where it would cost $17,000 in the blink of an eye to set up the blank space with everything we just listed, and just as many scenarios on top of that where you would end up spending much more. Coming up after a quick break, we're going to explore more money-saving backfires to avoid with respect to photography, dress alterations, and hiring a wedding coordinator. Don't go anywhere. I'll be back in a couple minutes. Today is the perfect time to start planning your honeymoon. Susan and our friends at Susan's Travel Services are available to you for free for help with all the planning and the details of your dream honeymoon. A lot of couples I work with are concerned that working with a travel agent is one more expense to pay, and that's simply not true. In fact, working with Susan to plan your exotic honeymoon is totally free and will likely save you a ton of time and money over researching and booking things on your own. Susan and her team have over 26 years of industry experience and specialize in travel around the world. Let Susan find you the best deals on all-inclusive resorts in Mexico and the Caribbean, overwater bungalows in the Maldives, or the African safari you've always dreamed of. Email Susan and tell her you heard this ad and get $50 off your honeymoon. Tell a friend and get a $50 referral fee when they mention your name at the time of booking. Email Susan at Susan'sTravelServices.com for free honeymoon planning services and get $50 off when you book with Susan and her team. Did you know now you can have a photo booth for your wedding that doesn't break the bank? Booth by Mail offers a complete setup delivered straight to your door that allows you to have all the fun and memories of a photo booth at a fraction of the typical price. Booth by Mail photo booths contain everything you need to create memorable moments for your guests. You get a camera, printer, sequin backdrop, props, and a digital photo album, all for under $300. So much fun. Best of all, there are no time constraints. Your photo booth will arrive one to two days before your wedding and you have unlimited use throughout the entire weekend. Use it for the rehearsal dinner, your wedding, and brunch. Booth by Mail is available anywhere in the continental U.S. It's also a great option if your wedding is out of town. Just have it shipped to your hotel or your reception venue. Go to boothbymail.com slash wedding planning podcast for more details or follow Booth by Mail on Facebook and Instagram. And as a special offer to our listeners, enter the code WPP to receive a 10% discount on your order. That website again is boothbymail.com slash wedding planning podcast. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at Generation Tux, and they see a couple of big problems with suit and tuxedo rentals for your wedding day. Ditch the crowded formal wear store and forget about having to pick up everything the day before your wedding. In a day and age when we can have literally anything delivered to our doorstep with the push of a button, why not your wedding day suits? Generation Tux gets it, and their service solves all of it. Here's how it works. Visit GenerationTux.com where you can build your look online right from the comfort of your couch. Generation Tux has developed a free home try-on program for grooms. Experience style and color from the comfort of your home months before your big day. The best part is that everything arrives on the doorstep of all the party members 14 days before the wedding, and they even offer on-demand fit consultations. That way, if there are any fit issues at all, there's plenty of time to take care of it. 
At Generation Tux, everyone's invited. Earn a free suit or tuxedo rental with five paid members, or even keep your suit or tux when seven members check out. The choice is yours. This is a huge value. Save time, save some money, and most importantly, save your sanity by checking these guys out at www.generationtux.com and use promo code WEDPOD for 10% off the entire groom's party. Let's jump back in with another big money-saving backfire opportunity, and that's photography. Here are some common ways that couples try and save money on their wedding photography. Number one is not hiring your photographer for a long enough time window. Number two, not considering extra fees that are hidden inside a contract. And these could be travel fees, additional hours, albums, retouching, final number of prints, or digital rights. And there are more ways to try and cut costs, but let's pause there and look at these two that I just mentioned with respect to hiring a professional photographer. So you've hired a pro, but you're maybe considering cutting a couple of corners. Number one is not hiring them for long enough. The wedding day is long. (laughs) And to get shots from getting ready all the way through the dancing at the end of the night could easily add up to 12 hours or more of shooting time. And of course, as we all know, time is money. So the longer your photographer is there, the more it's going to cost. Now, before you try to guess at how long you'll need photo coverage, talk with your photographer or potential photographers who you're interviewing. Talk with them about your wedding day timeline and get their input for how long they will need to be there. If getting ready shots and late night dance floor photos are both really, really, really important to you, then follow their suggestions for how long your total package should cover so that you don't risk losing any of those important moments. Trying to take a shortcut and cut back that total time in the interest of saving a couple hundred dollars might mean losing a lot of special moments. Now, if you have to cut short on coverage time in the interest of budget, if hiring someone for 14 hours is simply not an option, then my advice is to pick what's more important to you. Those photos of everyone getting ready together or the late night dancing photos. And then recruit your guests to cover the other part of the day with candid shots from their phones and their cameras. Now, aside of length of time, what about other hidden photography costs that might not jump out at you when you first take a look at a package price and you don't dive deeper? Choosing a photographer with the cheaper price tag can backfire big time if you're being nickel and dimed for a ton of little extras. I like to make the analogy between flying, uh, taking a trip, When you book on a budget bare bones airline and then they charge you $50 per bag and they charge you to reserve your seat and they charge you for a drink and they charge you to walk off the airplane and they charge you if you actually want to pick up your suitcase at baggage claim, that ticket can easily end up costing as much or more than the other airline that looked much more expensive on the surface. So let's dig into those little extras that can be hidden in a contract. And these are things like traveling fees for the photographer if they have to travel a certain distance to get to you, additional hours we mentioned just a minute ago, albums, retouching, the number of final prints you can expect, paying extra for the digital rights. These expenses can add up really, really quickly if they're not included. We can all agree that photography is a huge expense. This is one of the most expensive components of your wedding. And lots of us will be totally happy to splurge on this and to pay the bigger price tag just to get the higher quality. However, for those of us working with just a few thousand dollars total for the entire wedding, spending two, three, four thousand dollars for photography simply is not an option. 
So we start looking for ways that maybe we can bypass hiring a really pricey professional wedding photographer and other ways that couples try to adjust this cost include asking a friend to take your wedding photos or hiring someone inexperienced who's just getting started and trying to build their portfolio. Ahem, remember my story from the opening. We did this. We hired a $500 photographer who was trying to build his business. Another option that some people go for is just crowdsourcing photos from their guests. They ask people to bring their nice cameras and they ask their guests just be snap happy and take all the pictures. And that's the method of photography. So if any three of these apply to you, here are some really important things to consider before pursuing it further. And I'm going to list out some potential backfires that can result from taking a shortcut. First off, I want to roll all three of those situations together. So asking a friend, hiring someone without a ton of experience, or crowdsourcing photos from your guests. Basically, for all three scenarios, we're going to ask some version of, are you okay with non-professional quality photos? The worst case scenario is that you have no photos at all. The equipment's destroyed, the equipment isn't working, something happens, things get stolen. That's worst case scenario. You have not one picture of your wedding day. In the day of cell phones and people taking pictures, that's probably not going to happen. The second worst case scenario is that you have photos, but they're not good. So with that said, and this next one applies to pretty much every aspect of cobbling together a non-traditional photography plan, next thing is what is your backup plan? If you're hiring a friend who is a great photographer, that's a great option. What if she has a personal crisis or gets in an accident or something happens where she can't be there? Do you have someone else lined up who is a viable option to be at the wedding that day taking your pictures? If you hire someone without a lot of experience who doesn't have a backup staff and something happens on the wedding day or they don't show up, what would you do? I don't say this stuff to freak you out or to scare you, but we need to be prepared and we need to have a backup plan. Again, I appreciate that wedding photography is really, really, really expensive. So if this is an area that you're trying to cut back on, another critical thing is that you have met face to face with anyone you're considering hiring And at the very least, you have a signed contract before any money is exchanged. Now, that might not apply if you're working with a friend or a family member who you've known forever. I don't expect you to pin your cousin down and force her to sign a legally binded contract with you. Maybe you want to do that, and that's okay too. But certainly in Any situation where you're working with a stranger, a face-to-face meeting and a contract is an absolute zero exceptions necessity. What if you decide to work with a stranger? You communicate via email and a word about email. Pretty much anyone can show up professional and at their best when they're typing an email. So you email back and forth and you Venmo them 200 bucks to secure an engagement photo session and then they never show up. You're screwed. You're out 200 bucks and you have to go back to the drawing board. Meeting in person face to face will weed out the worst swindlers out there. They simply won't show up. And it will also give you at least a head start in determining if you feel comfortable with them, if they feel trustworthy, et cetera, et cetera. Also very important with someone who is a stranger, who's an up and coming photographer, who's trying to build a portfolio. These people are out there and some of them are awesome photographers and make for a great option. But before you take the leap, also so important, ask for recommendations. If they're a photography student, who are some of their instructors who you can contact? Do they have past employers you can contact? Couples they've photographed in the past? Families who they've done family photo shoots for? 
if this is literally the first time that they have ever shot any type of event, period, ever, and they have no references to give you, then I would keep looking. That does not strike me as a great option. And last quick point here, most everyone should have some kind of web presence, website presence, whether it's a dedicated website that they've created for their up and coming business, or it's just pages on social media. If someone is serious about building their photography business, then that should be evident online. So look up their Facebook page, look up their Instagram page, do a Google search. The internet is your friend in terms of finding dirt on potential vendors and in weeding out the people who are absolutely not going to fly. So use the internet to your advantage and really dive deep. And this goes for a professional photographer or a non-professional or a friend or a family member, pretty much any situation in photography, have an in-depth meeting and create a shot list of every specific moment that you want to have captured. Now, a professional photographer will have this probably all laid out for you and they know the moments and they know all the spots and the highlights and the things that they're going to catch. But if you're an amateur or someone who just does photography as a hobby and not necessarily always weddings, that might not be the case. (laughs) So don't risk being disappointed because there were no photos taken of the groom and his guys getting ready or no photos taken of the speeches. You need to walk through the wedding day in your mind and give whoever is doing the photos a detailed list of everything that you want captured. Again, you're planning your wedding. It's costing a crap ton of money. It's stressing you out. So you try to save money on photography. You work with an amateur. You work with a friend or family member. They don't end up giving you the shots you want. And bam, your attempt at saving $1,500 could completely ruin having that day captured in the way that you wanted it. So just go into it with eyes wide open and know what you're getting into. Have a backup plan. Review this section as it comes time to make a final decision if that applies to you. Photography is really important. This all coming from the person who did pay $500 to hire a complete amateur off the internet But before you do that, you just need to do your due diligence. You need to do all of the research and you need to feel comfortable and confident with exactly what you're getting into. And our next major spot where trying to save money can come back to haunt you is dress alterations. Now we've talked in the past about ways to save on dress alterations. Sometimes no matter how much research you do or how many great reviews someone has or how confident you feel that you're making the right decision, things can just go south. Let's talk about some ways that trying to save money on alterations can go terribly wrong and the smart ways to protect yourself from an alterations disaster. I'm going to start with the importance of factoring in alterations expenses from the very beginning. Look, alterations are really expensive. Keep this in mind as you start shopping for dresses. It is so important to factor in the cost of alterations along with your total dress budget. And if you're not going to lump the two together, then keep aside a pool of money that you know will be used for alterations. You can separate the two. That's fine. It's not realistic to buy a $6,000 designer dress at a sample sale for $2,000 and then do a celebration dance because you just saved $4,000 and beat the system and it's over. Depending on the dress itself and depending on the way it fits your body, you may very well end up spending more money on alterations than you paid for the dress. If that additional money wasn't in your dress budget to begin with, then you're going to find yourself in the hole and with an ill-fitting dress. 
Now, this is not an episode about wedding dress shopping or alterations, but I'd like to take this example a few steps further just to illustrate a really powerful point about alterations. So let's say that your $6,000 designer dress that you just scored for $2,000 really isn't your size at all. You bought it anyway because you figure you can take in the sides, you can alter the hem, you can shorten the bodice, all this stuff. First interjection, never buy a dress that doesn't fit you well. I don't care how good of a deal it is. If it doesn't fit your body well to begin with, then you're already facing an uphill battle. But since it's a sample sale and it's such a good price, you do it anyway. And with a million frantic people and no one actually available to spend any time one on one with you consulting about the details of how that dress fits and how it's going to need to be altered, you make a snap decision. You put down your credit card because you just know that this has to be the perfect dress. At your first alterations appointment, you're shocked to hear how much actually needs to be done, and you're even more shocked by the price. You think, surely it can't cost that much. Surely there's a cheaper option out there, and you start shopping around to other seamstresses. You try to cut a corner thinking, "Eh, the neighborhood alterations gig, they have a ton of great reviews on Yelp. Surely they can do a decent enough job to get this dress fitting me properly. I'm sad to share that things can snowball really, really quickly when you don't work with a bridal alterations specialist. I've said in the past that using a non-bridal tailor is a way to save some money, but that comes with a ton of stipulations, which I'm not going to go into now but we could definitely explore that further in another show. It just fits in perfectly to this whole theme of trying to save some money, but having it completely backfire. For today's purposes, if you want to take the safe road, hands down, the best way to shield yourself from an alterations disaster is to use the recommended alterations method by the bridal salon where you buy your dress. In most cases, the work will be backed up, insured, guaranteed by the store, which is the closest thing to giving yourself 100% peace of mind that your dress will be in good hands. Now, with that said, if you have a very simple style dress that you did not invest a ton of money in and it just needs one or two very basic tweaks, couldn't you get by with taking it to your beloved local tailor? Probably. Use your best judgment here and play out all the scenarios before making a final decision. Ask how much did I invest in this dress? How many areas actually need to be altered? Are we looking at intricate beadwork, lace, other special details that I need to consider? In most cases, putting a $3,000 dress on the line over saving a couple hundred dollars in alterations is just not worth it. If you're just starting to dress shop and you're concerned about alterations cost, then I would recommend adjusting your target dress price point now so that you have some extra money in this area of your budget and you don't have a panic attack at your first alterations appointment. Also, if you're just getting started with dress shopping, take advantage of the salespeople who are helping you and get some general idea of what alterations might need to be done and a price range for that work as you're trying on different styles. It could very, very deeply influence the final decision you make and whether or not that ends up being a good financial decision. And last thing for today, I know we reviewed this in depth last week, but I want to do a quick touch on hiring a day of coordinator or just trying to wing it by putting someone close to you in charge of managing the wedding day. Thank you so much to everyone who reached out with your stories on Instagram A wedding day planner or a day of coordinator, this was the resounding winner of the most likely thing to backfire. Some of your stories about day of coordinators, wedding planners, or lack thereof 
day of coordinator was suspiciously cheap. This is alarm bell number one as you're hiring any vendors and trying to avoid a backfire. If you're scratching your head and wondering why is this person's price so much lower than everyone else, then be alert and be very diligent in your research. This listener says she was a professional with good reviews but was suspiciously cheap and wow, the day would have been so much better without her there at all. She was mean, unprofessional, disorganized, and unprepared. Another listener shares, I thought one came with the venue, but it was only for the ceremony. On the day of, she was there for the ceremony only, so we had to wing it for the rest of the day. So important to clarify with your venue, if they include a coordinator, make sure you understand exactly how long they include the coordinator so that you have coverage all day. Next story, I tried to have my maid of honor in charge and it was a complete stressful disaster. I will forever regret not having things more organized, but at the time, in the midst of everything else going on, we just didn't think it was that big of a deal. That listener would gladly go back and change things and spend a few hundred dollars on hiring a dedicated day of coordinator. Next one, I busted my ass to plan the perfect wedding and show everyone a good time, but I couldn't let go on the day of. I didn't really trust our day of coordinator, but hired her anyway because her price was good and I ended up being way too involved in stuff going on on the wedding day. I really regret not continuing to look and hiring someone who I clicked with better regardless of price. And other big wedding planner or day of coordinator point person backfires were trying to get by without one, people who were trying to play it by ear. That's never a good idea. Another pitfall, not being realistic about everything that needed to be managed and missing big stuff like trash cans overflowing, unstocked restrooms, and things not being set up properly. So that's kind of a roll up of last week's episode on day of coordinators and assigning a point person to manage those details. And it's also, as you can see from these stories, a great illustration of wedding day backfires, how trying to save a few hundred bucks can totally come back to bite you in the butt. (sighs) And with that, I'll wrap it up. Today we reviewed four major wedding planning backfires that can happen when you're trying to cut a corner and save some money. We went over pitfalls with your venue options, photography, dress alterations, and the importance of having a good wedding day of coordinator or an assigned point person. There are so many more areas where trying to cut corners can come back to bite you. And if you have stories or experiences you'd like to share, I'm all ears. You can always be in touch by sending a DM on Instagram to wedding planning podcast, all one word. And I'll leave you with this closing thought. When an attempt to save money goes wrong, more than just money is at stake. You've also got precious time, stress, and your sanity on the line, all three of which are very precious resources. As you're planning and different things come up, take the time to think about your wedding options and what choices will be best for you. If you're faced with a challenging decision, mull over the questions and the thought points that we reviewed today and take your time, sleep on it, see how you feel in a couple days, be smart and follow your instincts. All those years ago, my intuition, my heart told me that the guy we just met with at Starbucks and did an engagement shoot with, this guy is amazing. And we loved him on the spot. Taking a chance on a $500 Craigslist photographer turned out to be a huge win for us. But the decision to dive in and take that plunge came along with some really deep considerations and a ton 
ton of thought beforehand. It was not a 30 second snap decision that we made in a frantic moment of excitement or in a rushed way to try to save money. Weigh the positive and the negative outcomes for any given savings opportunity. Do your research, sleep on it, and play it from there. You know what's best for you. And if a shortcut feels wrong, it probably is. Keep looking, keep your eyes and your heart open to creative solutions, and in the end, it will all click. Thank you so much for being here with me today. It's truly, truly an honor to be a part of your wedding plans. I thank you so much for your support of the podcast, and I'll talk to you again next week, same time, same place. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of the Wedding Planning Podcast. For details on any links and resources mentioned in today's show, be sure to take a peek at the show notes on your mobile device. You can also head over to weddingplanningpodcast.co for a complete library of past episodes and to sign up for weekly show notes and resources delivered straight to you via email. Until next time, have a great day, happy planning, and I can't wait to chat again soon. Cheers. Cheers.